Hey, welcome to another podcast with Neck Roots. This is Kit, and today we're doing uh, an interview with Dr. Alex Olson. This is Alex Olson. Um, hey. hey, yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, I appreciate you coming by. It'll be fun. We haven't had you're the first doctor we've had on. Hey, first time for everything, right? Yeah, there's got to be a first time for everything. Um, and so we're we're actually the way I met uh, Dr. Olson or Alex is um, we're actually selling our place and. And he liked it. He liked the ranch, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's probably the nicest house I've ever been in. So I'm so, glad I could get a good deal on it. You know? <laughs> that's what it takes to meet a doctor. You got to sell them something, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, to, this is a part of our series of what does it take? And um, so Alex is a, a family doctor now. Yes, family medicine. Yeah, fa- in family medicine. And um, that's one of those things that I think is challenging just because of the the time that it takes to become a doctor and the commitment in my mind, it's that commitment. When you commit, you know, you could change your mind um, a year or two or three years later. If you're like me, it'll be like squirrel. I'm going to chase this over here for a minute, you know? And so um, I think it's awesome that uh, that commitment and time that it takes. And we're going to talk about that. What does it take? Right. And, and you're going to help us shed some light on that today. I might go out of here and go be a doctor. You might, uh, or you might not, because it, it does take quite a bit. But you know, probably, probably anyone could do it theoretically. You don't, you don't need to be a rocket scientist, to be honest. So you don't have to be. You don't have to be. You don't. And the intelligence is lower down on the importance. Uh, not that doctors aren't intelligent, certainly, but uh, it takes a lot more work ethic. Yeah, it takes like, a lot of focus. Like, like a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah, you know, in uh, becoming a builder and doing the things that I do. Truthfully, we have to take a test. We have to take an exam, and it's um, the general. I think the general business and the OSHA safety requirements are more strict and strenuous than the actual, um, you know, whatever trade it is, or if you're a general contractor. But they do ask you like fifty percent questions here and fifty there. But um, and we do have to be licensed. But what's interesting, in my opinion, where I learned was on the job, right? And so. As you talk through your experience, maybe you can shed some light on that. Because, I mean, that's experience. You just can't discount experience. Yeah. And I learned a lot on the job that I would do differently from 20 years ago that I do differently today. So Yeah, it's no different whatsoever. I mean, it's you do a residency, and, and that's all the on-the-job kind of internship. And, yeah, I'd say 80% of what you need comes from there. And 10 to 20 percent from the med- all the schooling and years of that before that but um it, it does seem more like a lot of that is not that it's not important but it's kind of like a filtering process you know you want good candidates to become doctors so they make you go through some crazy obstacle course you know analogy is what i would use um prior to actually getting into the weeds of what it, what it takes to do day-to-day medicine like in real life they they're kind of making you, yeah, run through an, basically an obstacle course in my mind. That's how I looked at it. Like I had to get, and as long as you finish, you know, you get a medal and you become, you know, you can get this chance to become a doctor and then you learn the real, you know, the residency of what the guts of, um, you know, what it takes to take care of people and how to do that. But the, the first several years are just an academic marathon obstacle course that, that I'm not sure how useful in everyday life the majority of that stuff is, which you know, it's obvious to me, but maybe not obvious to the the regular person out there. It just doesn't know about the process. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's such a process that I would say if it was me being a lame person, I would say it's that commitment really. Right. They want to make sure you're committed. Um, Absolutely. And, I, and, you know, I kind of, I'm not sure if I said that thinking it wasn't, it was kind of a waste, but you know, I didn't mean that. Um, it, yeah, it definitely. Yeah. It's, it seems valid to kind of get those type of candidates and how do you do that you know i'm not sure but that's the way it's done currently. right yeah so take us back from the very beginning how, um how old are you now i am 35 35 so, years old yeah I, I went to school a little later if you're if you're a minted doctor and you went straight through i think you're more like uh 27 or 28 when you come out but i took some gaps in between which i could hit on briefly but yeah. yeah. So you're from Pennsylvania originally. Correct. Right. And yes. and you're going to tell us what brought you to Utah. But yeah, start from the very beginning. What was the walk okay. us through what it takes? What does it take to become so, a doctor? Yeah, I can start from my journey. Um, My journey is kind of 
also becoming a doctor, there's a, a health journey within it. Um, so I guess I'll start kind of March 16th, 2016. I was a medical student and um, I was in my first year towards the end of my first year. And, you know, I'd been through a lot, but I was thriving at the time and um, finally felt like I fell into, you know, a place where I was building success and doing excelling academically. Um, and one night I woke up in the middle of the night and um, just out of a complete dead sleep, like it never happened before, like a lightning bolt struck straight into my brain. Like all of a sudden someone flipped a light switch on in a completely dark room and I was awake like I'd never been awake before in, in, a, in a medically frightening way. Um, so that sort of ended up can't tell tell the story of my medical journey without telling the health story that goes along with it. Um, so that 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 was kind of sort of a turning point. But going back, and we can come back to that, or we'll get back to that. But going back to the beginning, um, I would say my health, my experiences started just pretty typical. You know, uh, pretty much growing up in a neighborhood, uh, typical neighborhood, and playing ice hockey and doing good in school. I, I was your typical follow the rules kind of kid. And, you know, I, I played ice hockey all growing up and I worked hard. I got A's and B's, um, that kind of thing. You know, probably nothing unexpected. I went to college right around where I lived at University of Pittsburgh and um, excelled there. I, I did really well. Um, just kind of part of my identity was um, working hard, uh, which you probably will find a lot with in, in these medical folks. But um, I, I was also a sleeper, man. I could sleep like people would find me in the library. They'd find me asleep. I'd been, I'd been there all day and night. I'd been there since two, three, I and mean, they'd be a running joke. They'd come and be like, they have to come wake me up because I'm just <laughs> like living, like literally living in the library. So some of that was my dedication. Some of that was, I was a really good sleeper. You know, I could just fall asleep <laughs> anywhere in the car, in the library, you know, wherever. So that was part of my identity. Um, so yeah, that took me through college, you know, doing all the things, jumping through the hoops, getting the, I was neuroscience and economics. So, you know, you have to be some type of biology major and you, know, you can do whatever else you want, but I had to take all these prerequisite courses and uh, it's a ton getting to that point. And I got to that point and after doing all that and achieve, achieving at that level, I was kind of burned out. And I, I think I told my parents, you know, it was kind of them also guiding me like your parents guide you. And I wasn't sure whose idea it was, mine or theirs, but I was like, you know, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. Um, and they were a bit distraught. Um, and at what point was that? Halfway through or? No, that was in medical pre pre you know so the co undergrad college or pre med or whatever and, and I was like I don't know if I want to go to medical school I don't know if I actually want to do be become a doctor you okay. know that was had been the plan, um and they were you know my mom was pretty much like well that had been the plan you know and it was a bit upsetting to her, um however, um I did apply very late in the application cycle because I was like well maybe I should and kind of like an afterthought and I got rejected so I did not get in anyway. Uh, so yeah, I was rejected from medical school and that led me to doing several different jobs, which is why I said I didn't go straight through. So I didn't go back to medical school until five years after undergrad, which isn't the typical. Most people do just kind of run it straight through. They graduate from undergrad, go into medical school, do medical school, do residency, become a doctor. So well, go, going back to the getting rejected, was that a motivator for you to continue? Uh, maybe not at the time or did it deter you a little bit? I think it was in the back of my mind and in the front of my mind, I was, like I said, I was kind of, I kind of used it to brush it off. Cause I was like, well, I don't know if I wanted to do this anyway, but yeah, ultimately in, well, looking back, I think it was both. Yeah. It was probably it ended up being a motivator because you know, anytime you get a rejection like that, yeah, even if whether you're admitting it to yourself or not, you, you want to go and turn that around um, or see it through. But um, yeah, I worked some odd jobs. I was, I went, led me into being a um, first job I had out of high school. I was, working actually at a juvenile detention center as a purchasing coordinator, which somehow I got on a Craigslist, which was very interesting. And then I did some office type jobs. I worked as a nurse aide, which was the only medical relevant kind of, so I was still kind of thinking in my head, like maybe I'll be there someday. And, you know, being a nurse assistant is, is very different than a doctor, but you're, you're really personally caring for these people. You know, you are literally sometimes wiping their butts and um you know cl cleaning up after them and helping so so i did get some on the ground experience there uh that, that helped in the future of the journey but really just going through a lot of odd jobs and kind of sort of floundering not knowing what i wanted to do with my life and um finally i came back around to reapplying like 
you know, I left this stone unturned, but let's go back and, and see that through it. And um, I did get back accepted into medical school, um, a school in Erie, uh, Pennsylvania. And um, I started started in there after about four years, I think, of, of a gap in any kind of study, right? Medical yeah. school. Medical school, they always say it's like drinking from a fire hydrant. Right. So, you know, put, put your mouth up to a fire hydrant, like it's going to blow you away. And, and I was literally blown away. I went, I went into the program and I um, hadn't, hadn't cracked the book in four years. And, and I, I, I freaked out. I, I literally freaked myself out. I think I was in looking back, like what they might say, like a depressed state uh, mentally. Um, I was just like, I can't handle this. I can't do it. I'm not going to make it. I was thinking of every out in my head. Um, I, I had done some music prior to that and like tried to make an album and, and I was telling my parents like, I'm going to go make this album. Like, I don't need this. This <laughs> isn't, this isn't going to be it. Like, and like, obviously, you know, just like sports and music and entertainment, like it's like the 1% of the 1% get there. Like the yeah. odds of that are so low. And if you get into medical school, like you just got to make it through and, and yeah. you know, jump through this obstacle course and, and do all these things and, you know, be a good person and, you know, be a doctor. And then, and then you kind of, you, in a sense, you, you, you got a good job, right? So uh, in there in the adult eyes it was probably a terrible decision but i i i thought i was going to do it and i dropped out i dropped out of school after about four weeks i said i can't do it wow. and uh i um i went back to working at some one of my old bosses took me back to the job you know that was one of the big deals i was like you need somewhere to go like you don't even have another job and i got an old boss to rehire me and i said i'm dropping out i'm leaving i packed up my stuff i left and and, uh, See what happens when you're a hard worker, man. You make one phone call, and he says, "Come on, right?" Yes, I, I don't, I don't know if that's why they took me back, but anyway, uh, so I did that and um, worked there for about a year again. And uh, man, anyone out there who knows about you know doing doing things and then having regrets in life and stuff, and I, I ended up I went back to the thing that it wasn't working out before because why did I go to medical school in the first place? And man, did I ever regret um, doing that in a sense. I, I felt like I really missed an opportunity and I didn't see it through. And, you know, I just left after four weeks because I was freaked out, like I said. And, and I definitely felt badly about that. Um, so I, I looked into seeing what the school could do for me. And they said, well, technically, um, you'd have to reapply and go through the same process just like everyone else, even though you were already admitted here and left. Um, so I did that and I retook the MCAT, which is this rigorous, like medical admissions test, even though I'd already studied hour, countless hours taking it before I had to restudy, retake it. And, um, you know, long story short, I, I got back into medical school at this same program and, um, they, they gave me an opportunity again and, you know, and I ended up this time around uh since spoiler alert you know i'm a doctor so i, I made it made it through but yeah. but it was definitely ups and downs in that part of it so i mean i guess that gets us back up to speed to where i started i'm you know clipping away in medical school now and and we're a year into this thing and i've been through a lot of ups and downs and dropping out coming back and i finally feel like i've got my feet underneath me and you know oh i actually did a pre-program so when they readmitted me after i took the test and everything i did a year of prep which was super helpful instead of just going back and putting my mouth over the fire hydrant i did sort of a prep program that had a contingency that you had to get a certain gpa to get readmitted which i did so i was coming into the first year of medical school sort of like pedaling full steam instead of just hopping on the bike um so so yeah so i'm i'm full steam I'm, i jumped on you know to a moving thing and i'm doing well this time around and then all of a sudden in March of the end of the first year, you know, my, the, the floor just falls out from underneath me and my health just dives straight down into a concrete force. And, and, uh, I just, my health just blows up. I, I lose my health. I have no idea what's going on. So I, I woke up one night in the middle of the night and I was never the same again. I couldn't sleep. Uh, I couldn't eat. I could not, um, function essentially and the mind and the brain i fully believe are two separate things and you know any doctor i'd went to or when this was happening would or even myself if i was looking back treating a kid like something like this happened to me i would have said it's psychological man you're in a very difficult process and uh i i, I firmly believe what happened to me was physiology my physiology crashed i could go through i never figured out what happened i could go through a million different scenarios i was taking some 
weird hormone disrupting hair loss pill at the time, which was completely stupid. That could have been something uh, that messed with my body's chemistry. I got a concussion around the time this happened. I'd had a lot of concussions playing hockey. I know that's very important in the body chemistry, keeping that certainly stress. I, you know, while I was thriving, I was staying up till three, four in the morning, cramming this material, memorizing ungodly amounts of things or trying to, and then I'd go take a test, like a three, four hour test. I'd rip off a three, four hour test. Then I'd go back home and crash out and sleep. And like, that's obviously a terrible set up for your for your body's homeostasis and stuff like that so i was definitely not taking care of myself although in the sense i would have said i was doing well right um so yeah i never figured out what happened but i i my body basically just lost itself like i couldn't i, I was sleeping ever since then i was sleeping two hours a night i i didn't even know when i was hungry or what i lost my whole sense of what appetite was i couldn't work out in the gym anymore something neurochemical endocrinologically just lost itself inside my body so something it, neurologically wasn't was not corresponding was not with the body and when it happened i thought should i go to the er like something was so wrong but it wasn't it wasn't like a medical thing like you can see like you lost a limb or they found a cancer on an x-ray um and there's all kinds of medical problems out there like this like that's not unique to me like whatever happened to me was unique i guess or whatever caused it but you know there's so many disease like chronic fatigue syndrome I'm sure people have heard of or X, Y, and Z syndrome, uh, fibromyalgia, you might've heard of. There's all these syndromes that are real, probably real entities, but even medical people, you'll go in there and behind your back, they might, they might look and be like, oh, what's wrong with this guy? You know, because, yeah, because you have a whole bunch of symptoms, but we don't understand the physiology of it and you're just out of luck. So I found myself in the medical training and everything with being a patient almost and getting sick with some kind of ailment. That's a mystery thing. And I, no one even in the medical field could fix me. Uh, so that was pretty devastating. Um, and somehow, you know, after that, I, I stopped thriving and I was just trying to make it right. Just trying to get through and, and thank God, you know, I do thank God that, and, uh, you know, ancestors, I'm spiritual. I think my ancestors are looking out for me up, up above. For there. sure they are. Um, man. those are kind of like my religion, but I, I thank them every day for, forget me through that process because I, I pretty much had to scrape by after that. I, I it was, it was kind of, uh, definitely a, a life changing experience. However, I, I then to finish this story, um, of my journey would touch on some things that I think got me through this whole process. Um, both health, a health journey of just losing your health in the middle of life. And you know, it, one thing I would say is with health problems like this, I wish our society had a pause button for people like, oh, or some kind of backup plan, which this might be like another podcast or topic. But like, what if when you, because a lot of people go through health crisis or events and they got to keep, keep going, or maybe it's good to keep going. I don't know. And just push through, but you know, that's, but it's probably both, right? Sometimes yeah. it's good to hit pause, yeah, but you don't know when that time is. And sometimes it's good to keep motion and, emotions moving exactly if i hit pause i may never finish the thing out but i will say why i said that i guess leads to because i think that one of the things that prevented me from healing which i've learned after having moved through medical school and residency is just the stress this the cycle if you're under psychological stress or just a lot of stress in life you may not be in a place where you can heal and that might be on a chemical level, even though you don't understand, it doesn't seem like it. So from whatever it is, from your cancer, from your mystery health ailment like I had, or just from not feeling great or whatever your problem is, it's just so fascinating to me. Some of the things I did to try to fix myself during that did absolutely nothing. And then I, you know, once I'm done with the residency, which was even worse than medical school hours, I was working 80, 100 hour weeks or, or whatever. And, you know, you just can't be healthy during that. And after I finished all that, some of the same things I tried to, to help, to, you know, improve my health, which thankfully I have improved my health a long way since then worked amazingly and had zero effect during the, during that time of being in that stressful environment. So it's, yeah. it's probably how much weight, I mean, you take in, take in, take in and don't ever let it out sooner or later it gets heavy. It does. And probably on, spiritual and and that stuff affects your body chemistry and, yeah um yeah so that was big for me just getting myself finally through the whole mountain of medical school residency training 
you know, the, in the hospital type training. So medical school was how long? Medical school was four years. Four years. Four years. Two years of straight just academics passing tests and two years of clinicals where you're both shadowing people in the hospital and still passing examinations. Yeah. And then once you graduate that, you're placed in a hospital and um, that's depends on your pathway you chose. My family medicine is three years, so you're working in a hospital for three years and, and a little bit in a clinic. And in my case, or in a lot of cases, you, you're working crazy hours. Like you might be on call 24 hours. Like, so we, we, I'd go work a day, you know, 12 hour shift. And then you'd have to take turns at the end of your work day. You would get, instead of going home, you go to the hospital and sleep there. And well, you don't sleep a whole lot. If, if something emergent happens, you have to go to that, that hospital room or, you know, a medical emergency or, or just whatnot. So, so the hour age is not kind on the body in that, in that, regard but yeah. it does end so there's a light at the end of the tunnel for folks interested in that and you know it's a three-year process so you're done with that and and then um and then you are officially i guess a, a doctor once you pass the board examination uh, after your residency and then you can take a job which is what led me to take a job in utah but before that i did medical school in pennsylvania and residency in pennsylvania and yeah so it, yeah so it's a lot of schooling it's you know four years of undergrad four years of medical school three years of residency in my case surgeries five and most of those surgical specialties and if you do a fellowship after that like if you're you specialize after being general surgeon like colorectal surgery you know your five-year residency then becomes another one to two years after that so that's seven years on top of the four years of medical school so wow yeah, it's definitely not not something you can even really change your mind about, to be honest with you, in the middle yeah. of that. It's kind of, you. I mean, not, do people do that or do some people not make it through? Of course, but thankfully that's the minority. Then that's why the selection process in the beginning is so thorough of like making sure you really can jump through the obstacle course because they don't want you in the middle of this. Financially, you've already invested and time-wise you've invested. You, you can't just say like, I don't want to do this anymore really. Like right. you got to be invested and you got to be the right candidate. So they don't want to get the wrong people in there. So, so while it might not be, you know, one for one relevant to what you're going to be doing that pre that medical school part and, and the undergrad part and all the schooling and everything has a purpose, I guess you could say. Well, I think about uh, some of the things that you said, Alex, and one thing that comes to mind is how do you balance that? Um, just the emotional weight and stress, you know, with the how do you balance? It? I mean, school, it's obviously a lot harder than it is now, right, where you're um, practicing and, and you have a day off and you're not cramming for tests or whatever, but there's still stress and there's still different, um, issues, right? How do you balance that emotionally and maybe, maybe emotionally slash spiritually, um, uh, with the pressures that come with being a, a doctor? Um, for me, it's been important to, um, sounds kind of corny, but all the stuff I tell a lot of people of, you know, treat your body right and um, exercise and eat healthy. Yeah. Um, and, and that's whatever it is, whatever that means for you. Like, I'm not saying you got to go out and run a marathon or, you know, um, like when I was in my health throes, I was like, well, how can I exercise? I'm, I'm in terrible health. Like, well, I turned to yoga and that's a gentle form of spiritual exercise. And, and it's, it's amazing for your body, the benefits of that. And, and it was something I could do even though I wasn't feeling great. And, and it gave me, you know, peace and kept me grounded and took off a lot of stress and probably helped my breathing a whole lot. It's a lot of breath work. Um, so that, that, yeah, just exercise I think is big and, and trying to keep yourself because yeah, if you're not okay, you know, obviously the people I'm taking care of aren't going to get good, good service or good care in any industry. If you're not doing well, you're not going to give good customer service. So right. that's huge. Yeah. Finding whatever, whatever your thing is to, to get you exercising. Cause those natural endorphins, you know, keep your brain happy and eating healthy, right? You put, put healthy stuff inside your body and that's, that's gotta be key to making you feel good. So yeah, kind of corny, but those are pretty, pretty good cornerstones of, of a healthy person. Well, you have to know, cause you know what your car and everything else comes with a check engine light, man. And the body doesn't, right? Yeah. yeah one of the things I was saying, alluding to trying that I tried and in, when I was in, in the throes of my stressful life and the health throes that didn't work was I, I tried to go gluten free and apparently for some people even if you don't have celiac disease you can you can be pretty inflamed by certain you know inflammatory foods or things and gluten's one of them and you know I tried that after leaving school and and I just felt so much better like uh, I was having stomach pain when I ate and I couldn't breathe out of my nose and just 
And going and gluten free com- completely went away. And you know, I did all these crazy diets when I was in the throes of what was going on with me in medical school, and nothing worked at all. Just nothing. Mm. So you know, there's something to be said for getting yourself to a better place before you start making drastic changes or trying to treat yourself. Um, how you do that is is another question. But yeah. You know, I told a story uh, on one of the previous podcasts, and I think it's interesting. One of my guys, he jumped off of this, um, jumped off out of the back of the truck, wasn't paying attention, and jumped onto a board. And the nail, there was a big nail, it was a screw, and it went straight through his boot, right out the top. And, dude, this guy freaked out in pain, right? I mean, freaked out in pain. You, you thought he just got shot right between the eyes. And, and, and he was... He goes, it went right through my foot. And I go, it did. He goes, yeah, I'm like freak. So I call my wife, I'm like, babe, we're gonna have a, we're gonna have a workers comp situation. And so we couldn't move the board. I mean, this dude was howling like a tomcat, right? And so, long story short, we just cut the board, right? Made it manageable. Took him in because, I mean, every bump I hit, he was yelling at me, right? And and it looked terrible. It really did. It didn't look good. I'm not making fun of him, but. I, I did a little bit, you know, on the way there. I was yeah. telling him, toughen up, son. And so we get in there, and, and, and we're in the emergency room, and I'm giving him a hard time, and the doctor pulled me aside, and he goes, hey. He goes, this, let me let me take care of this and get this out, get it cleaned up. And he's in a lot of pain, and I'm like, okay. He goes, you, it's okay to give him a hard time, but let's not do it right now. And I need him to focus. I'm like, okay. So they pull the curtain back, and I – anyways, about 20 minutes later <laughs> – I go back in there to check on him and and it had gone right between the web, like really close to the to the foot, but it went between the two toes and, and it scratched just you know, there was a little blood. But in <laughs> his mind, in his mind, Alex, I'm telling you, the dude got I mean, it he got penetrated all the way through the top of his foot and it's lucky it didn't go up his leg to his knee, right? That's really funny. And so then I started the heckling, right? Yeah. <laughs> and the doctor pulls me aside. He goes, you don't understand. This patient didn't know the difference. He was truly in pain at the time. I said, how could he be in pain? It's a scratch. He goes, the mind don't know the difference between fact or fiction. And that was an eye opener for me, right? And it just goes to tell you, it's a, you, you do have to be somewhat your, ba- your brain's powerful. I think your situation emotionally and your stress level has a lot to do with your health because I saw this guy, I mean, on his deathbed because this thing penetrated and went through his foot and then come to find out in actuality, it missed everything, right? And just went between his toes and it looked worse than it was. And so you know, I do, I called him Scratch from then on, right? Hey, Scratch. <laughs> and gave him a hard time. But, but what he said was eye-opening, you know what I mean? And so keeping our mental in check i think helps our physical right yeah keeping that balance absolutely yeah and that's that's so true and yeah they i do believe that that they're separate separate things the mind and the brain man and they're they're special thing the mind is a special thing that that even any medical person has absolutely no idea i mean consciousness how how they can't explain it you're getting to einstein level physics they'll start trying to give you theories on how those chemicals and electrical connections start forming thoughts and conscious thoughts and things like that. It's just, there's, there's a lot of gray here in medicine and life. And, but, uh, I think in everything. So I think the one thing I take away from hearing your story, man, is you're a grinder and and you saw it all the way through. In my opinion, where you, where you took a break or said, Hey, this isn't for me. And you bounced out and then you came back. And then a year later you said, yeah, 100% this ain't for me. And you, and you took off and you come back. Sometimes you go down the road that might not be the right road, but when you get back to the right road, you know it's the right road because you already went down the wrong road, right? Or had that regret. I love those experiences of failure and regret because they're stepping stones to build your castle, right? Exactly. And and if you look back now, I think the ultimate regret would be not the four years that you took off or whatever that you maybe that you wouldn't have finished. And so, um, you know, from your story, I can see, hey, pushing and continuing to push and never giving up is has served you well and a lot of that comes with work i don't care what it is if it's important in this life it requires one common denominator and that's your work ethic right yeah i agree and just a couple other tidbits from my journey i just wanted to maybe they sound cliche but um for me if you are going through a health event 
or something like that. Do not stop living. That was key for me. I mean, I was just, I was, you know, the floor came out from underneath me. I think I already said, but you know, I tried to keep going. Luckily I read the right things and tried to keep going on with my life. You know, I, I kept having positive experiences, went on vacations, you know, met my wife, you know, I don't treat it like I got to wait till I get better, you know, before I'm going to keep living. I think that's a huge mistake and you'll miss out on a lot. Um, drop what you can't do. If, if your health journey or life journey takes you somewhere and you lose the ability to do something or just from age, forget about it, man. There's so many new things you can learn or, or do and, and pick up something else or, you know, turn the things, turn, turn to those things. Um, focus on what you, what you can do. Um, and then some other things that, that also help me through time, man, that old saying of time heals wounds is just is tried and tested as time. I mean, it, it's just true that time passing helps you get through. I almost felt like I lost myself. Like part of me, part of me died when this, when this health thing happened and, you know, time helps, helps that time and acceptance help that heal. And, you know, I kind of felt like I made a mistake during this, which I'm not sure if that happened, but if you do make mistakes, take something from your mistake, right? And, and then it becomes a whole meaningful experience and it's not just a mistake in your life, you know, and you could, you can always take something from, you can think back to what, when you made a mistake and something positive that came out of it. And that's, that's true. Um, there. Dude, I love those. I, I appreciate you sharing that because when you fall down, there's always something when you're down there, pick it up. Yeah, yeah, as absolutely. you stand back up, pick it up because you can learn from it. And I think it's those times that make us committed. You know what I mean? It's like in business when you're buying and selling companies or doing anything in 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 an entrepreneurial way. Someone that has failed along the way is a great person to mentor or that that's persevered and gone through and figured it out. Because the guys that get in and it just they hit you know that that top tier right out of the gate. They don't know what that struggle is like, and that struggle is what builds that character and what builds that perseverance and that grit, you call it. That's so true. And so I, I appreciate those stories. They're what we need to hear. 98% of us know that, hey, when it gets tough, that means we got to get tougher and, and learn from our past. So um, I appreciate you coming on. And you know what? Where are you practicing now? You're a family doctor in family medicine? Yeah, now I am actually in South Ogden and uh, yeah, Intermountain Healthcare. Um, obviously no, no, nothing I said is the, of the opinion of Inter Mountain healthcare disclaimer, right. <laughs> but no, yeah, I practice at the South Ogden Clinton in, in, in South Ogden. Okay. That's cool. Well, I appreciate it. If there's nothing else, Alex, I appreciate you being on with us and sharing your story. It's definitely a story of perseverance. And if yeah. you, if you guys like this, you know what, subscribe, um, and make sure we get it out to a lot of people. Keep going, keep pushing, never give up. Bless up. Thank you.